John Burroughs, Bird's Nests, Part 2. This was amid a thick undergrowth, moving on into a passage of large stately hemlocks with only here and there a small beech or maple rising up into the perennial twilight. I paused to make out a note which was entirely new to me. It is still in my ear. Though unmistakably a bird note, it yet suggested the beating of a tiny lambkin. Presently the birds appeared, a pair of the solitary vireo. They came flitting from point to point, alighting only for a moment at a time, the male silent but the female uttering the strange tender note. It was a rendering into some new sylvan dialect of the human sentiment of maidenly love. It was really pathetic in its sweetness and childlike confidence and joy. I soon discovered that the pair were building a nest upon a low branch for a few a few yards from me. The male flew cautiously to the spot and adjusted something and the twain moved on, the female calling to her mate at intervals. Lovey, lovey, with a cadence and tenderness in the tone that rang in the ear long afterward. The nest was a was suspended to the fork of a small branch, as is usual with the vireos, plentifully lined with lichens and bound and rebound with masses of coarse spider webs. There was no attempt at concealment except in the neutral tints which make it look like a natural growth of the dim gray woods. Continuing my random walk, I next paused in a low part of the woods where the larger trees began to give place to a thick second growth that covered an old bark peeling. I was standing by a large maple when a small bird darted quickly away from it, as if it might have come out of a hole near its base. As the bird paused a few yards from me and began to chirp uneasily, my curiosity was at once excited. When I saw it was the female morning ground warbler, and remembered that the nest of this bird had not yet been seen by any naturalist, but not even Dr. Brewer had even seen, ever seen the eggs, I felt that here was something worth seeing for, looking for. So I carefully began the search, exploring inch by inch the ground, the base and the roots of the tree and the various shrubby growth about it, till finding nothing and fearing I might really put my foot in it, I bethought me to withdraw to a distance and after some delay return again, and thus forewarned, note the exact point from which the bird flew. This I did, and returning, had little difficulty in discovering the nest. It was placed but a few feet from the maple tree in a bunch of ferns and about six inches from the ground. It was qu quite a massive nest composed entirely of the stalks and leaves of dry grass with an inner lining of fine dark brown roots. The eggs, three in number, were of light fresh color uniformly speckled with fine brown specks. The cavity of the nest was so deep that the back of the sitting bird sank below the edge. In the top of a tall tree a short distance farther on, I saw the nest of the red-tailed hawk, a large mass of twigs and dry sticks. The young had flown but still lingered in the vicinity, and as I approached the mother bird flew about over me, squealing in a very angry, savage manner. Tufts of the hair and other indigestible material of the common meadow mouse lay around on the ground beneath the nest. <clears throat> as I was about leaving as I was about leaving the woods, my hat almost brushed the nest of the red-eyed vireo which hung basket-like on the end of a low, drooping branch of the beach. I should never have seen it had the bird kept her place. It contained three eggs of the bird's own and one of the cow bunting. The strange egg was only just perceptibly larger than the others, yet in the three days after, when I looked into the nest again and found all but one egg hatched, the young interloper was at least four times as large as either of the others, and with such a superabundance of bowls as to almost smother his bedfellows beneath them. That the intruder should fare the same as the rightful occupants and thrive with them was more than ordinary potluck, but that it alone should thrive, devouring as it were all the rest, is one of those freaks of nature in which she would seem to discourage the homely virtues of prudence and honesty. Weeds and parasites have the odds greatly against them, yet they wage a very successful war nonetheless. The woods hold not such another gem as the nest of the hummingbird. The finding of one is an event to date from. It is the next best thing to finding 
an eagle's nest. I have met with but two, both by chance. One was placed on the horizontal branch of a chestnut tree with a solitary green leaf forming a complete canopy about an inch and a half above it. The repeated spiteful dartings of the bird past my ears as I stood under the tree caused me to suspect that I was intruding upon someone's privacy. And following it with my eye, I soon saw the nest, which was in the process of construction. Adopting my usual tactics of secreting myself nearby, I had the satisfaction of seeing the tiny artist at work. It was the female, unassisted by her mate. At intervals of two or three minutes, she would appear with a small tuft of some cottony substance in her beak and, alighting quickly in the nest, arrange the material she had brought using her breast as a model. The other nest I discovered in a dense forest on the side of a mountain. The sitting bird was disturbed as I passed beneath her. The whirring of her wings arrested my attention when, after a short pause, I had the good luck to see through, the, through an opening in the leaves the bird returned to her nest, which appeared like a mere wart or excrescence and, and a small branch, on a small branch. <clears throat> the hummingbird, unlike all others, does not alight upon the nest but flies into it. She enters it as quick as a flash but as light as any feather. Two eggs are the complement. They are perfectly white and so frail that only a woman's fingers may touch them. Incubation lasts about ten days. In a week the young have flown. The only nest like the hummingbirds and comparable to it in neatness and symmetry is that of the blue-gray gnatcatcher. This is often saddled upon the limb in the same manner, though it is generally more or less pendant. It is deep and soft, composed mostly of some vegetable down covered all over with delicate tree lichens and except that it is much larger appears almost identical with the nest of the hummingbird. But the nests of nests, the ideal nest, after we have left the deep woods is unquestionably that of the Baltimore Oriole. It is the only perfectly pensile nest we have. The nest of the or orchard oriole is indeed mainly so, but this bird generally builds lower and shallower more after the manner of the vireos. The Baltimore Oriole loves to attach its nest to the swaying branches of the tallest elms, making no attempt at concealment, but satisfied if the position be high and the branch pendant. This nest would seem to cost more time and skill than any other bird structure. A peculiar flax-like substance seems to be always sought after and always found. The nest, when completed, assumes the form of a large suspended gourd. The walls are thin but firm and proof against the most driving rain. The mouth is hemmed or overhanded with horsehair, and the sides are usually sewed through and through with the same. Not particular as to the matter of secrecy, the bird is not particular to the material, so that, so that be of the nature of the strings or threads. A lady friend once told me that, while working by an open window, one of these birds approaching during her momentary absence and seizing a skein of some kind of thread or yarn made off with it to its half-finished nest. But the perverse yarn caught fast in the branches and in the bird's effort to extricate it got hopelessly tangled. She tugged away at it all day but was finally obliged to content herself with a few detached portions. The fluttering stings were an eyesore to her ever after, and passing and repassing, she would give them a spiteful jerk as much to say, there's that confounded yarn that gave me so much trouble. <clears throat> From Pennsylvania, Vincent Barnard, to whom I am indebted for other curious facts, sent me this interesting story of an Oreo. He says a friend of his, curious in such things on observing the bird beginning to build, hung out near the prospective nets, nest skeins of many-colored zephyr yarn, which the eager artist readily appropriated. He managed it so that the bird used nearly equal quantities of various high, bright colors. The nest was made unusually deep and capacious, and it may be questioned if such a thing of beauty was ever before woven by the cunning of a bird. Nuttall, by, the, by far the most genial of American ornithologists, relates the following. 
A female oriole, which I observed attentively, carried off to her nest a piece of lamp wick ten or twelve feet long. This long string and many other shorter ones were left hanging out for a week before both ends were waddled into the sides of the nest. Some other little birds, making use of similar materials, at times twitched these flowing ends, and generally brought out the busy Baltimore from her occupation in great anger. I may perhaps claim indulgence for adding a little more of the biography of this particular bird as a representative also of the instincts of her race. She completed the nest in about a week's time without any aid from her mate, who indeed appear, appeared but seldom in her company and was now become nearly silent. For fibrous material she broke, hackled, and gathered the flax of the Asclepi, Asclepius and Hib hibiscus stalks, tearing off long strings and flying with them to the scene of her labors. She appeared very eager and hasty in her pursuits and collected her materials without fear or restraint. While three men were working in the neighboring walks and m many persons were visiting the garden. Her courage and perseverance were truly admirable. If watched too narrowly, she saluted with her usual scolding, shar, 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 seeing no reason probably why she should be interrupted in her indispensable occupation. Though the males were now comparatively silent on the arrival of their busy mates, I could not help observing this female in a second continually vociferating, apparently in strife. At last she was observed to attack the second female very fiercely, who slyly intruded herself at times into the same tree where she was building. These contests were angry and often repeated. To account for the, this animosity, I now rec recollected that, the t that two fine males had been killed in our vicinity, and I therefore concluded the intruder to be left without a mate yet she had gained the affections of the consort of the busy female, and thus the cause of their jealous quarrel became apparent. Having obtained the confidence of her faithless paramour, the second female began preparing to weave a nest in an adjoining elm by tying together certain pendant twigs as a foundation. The male now associated chiefly with the intruder whom he even assisted in her, in her labor, yet did not wholly forget his first partner, who called on him one evening in a low, affectionate tone, which was answered in the same strain. While they were thus engaged in friendly whispers, suddenly appeared the rival, and a violent recontra ensued, so that one of the females appeared to be greatly agitated and fluttered with spreading wings as if considerably hurt. The male, though prudently neutral in the contest, showed his culpable partiality by flying off with his paramour, and for the rest of the evening left the tree to his pugnacious consort. Cares of another kind, more imperious and tender, at length reconciled or at least terminated. These disputes with the jealous females, and by the aid of their neighboring bachelors, who are never wanting among these and other birds, peace was at length completely restored by the restitution of the quiet and happy condition of monogamy. Let me not forget to mention the nest under the mountain ledge, the nest of the common peewee, a modest, mossy structure with four pearl-white eggs looking out upon some wild scene and overhung by beetling crags. After all has been said about the elaborate high-hung structures, few nests perhaps awaken more pleasant emotions in the mind of the beholder than this of the peewee. The gray silent rocks with caverns and dens where the fox and the wolf lurk, and just out of their reach in a little niche as if, grew, as if it grew there, the mossy tenement. Nearly every high projecting rock in any range has one of these nests. Following a trout, trout stream up a wild mountain gorge not long since, I counted five in the distance of a mile, all within easy reach but safe from the minks and the skunks and well housed from the storms. In my native town I know a pine and an oak-clad hill, round top with a bold precipitous front extending halfway around it. Near the top and along the front or side there crops out a ledge of rocks unusually high and cavernous. One immense layer projects many feet, allowing a person or many persons standing upright to move freely beneath it. There is a del delicious spring of water there and plenty of wild, cool air. 
The floor is of loose stone, now trod by sheep and foxes, once by Indian and wolf. How I have delighted from boyhood to spend a summer day in this retreat or take refuge there from a sudden shower. Always the freshness and coolness, and always the delicate mossy nest of the Phoebe bird. The bird keeps her place till you are within a few feet of her when she flits to a near branch, nearby branch, and with many oscillations of her tail observes you anxiously. Since the country has become settled, this peewee has fallen into strange practice of occasionally placing its nest under a bridge, hay shed, or other artificial structure where it is subject to all kinds of interruptions and annoyances. When placed thus, the nest is larger and coarser. I know a hayloft beneath which a pair has regularly placed its nest for several successive seasons. Arranged along on a single pole which sags down a few inches from the flooring it was intended to help support the three, the three of these structures marking the number of years the birds have nested there. The foundation is of mud with a superstructure of moss elaborately lined with hair and feathers. Nothing can be more perfect and exquisite than the interior of one of these nests yet a new one is built every season. Three broods however are frequently reared in it. The peewees, as a class, are the best architects we have. The kingbird builds a nest altogether admirable using various soft cotton and woolen substances and sparing neither time nor material to make it substantial and warm. The green-crested peewee builds its nest, in many instances, wholly of the blossoms of the white oak. The wood peewee builds a neat, compact, socket-shaped nest of moss and lichens on a horizontal branch. There is never a loose end or shred about it. The sitting bird is largely visible above the rim. She moves her head freely about and seems entirely at her ease. A circumstance which I have never observed in any other species. The nest of the great crested flycatcher is seldom free from snake skins, three or four being sometimes woven onto it, into it. About the thinnest, shallowest nest for its situation that can be found is that of the turtle dove. A few sticks and straws are carelessly thrown together, hardly sufficient to prevent the eggs from falling through or rolling off. The nest of the passenger pigeon is equally hasty and insufficient, and the squabs often fall to the ground and perish. The other extreme among our common birds is furnished by the ferrig Gunius thrush, which collects together a mass of material that would fill half a bushel measure, or by the fish hawk, which adds to and repairs its nest year after year till the hole would make a cartload. One of the rarest of nests is that of the eagle, because the eagle is one of the rarest of birds. Indeed, so seldom is the eagle seen in its presence always seen that its presence always seems accidental. It appears as if merely pausing on the way while bound for some distant unknown region. One September, while a youth, I saw the ring-tailed eagle, the young of the golden eagle, an immense dusky bird, the sight of which filled me with awe. It lingered about the hills for two days. Some young cattle, a two-year-old colt, and a half-dozen sheep were at the pasture on a high ridge that led up to the mountain and in the plain view of the house. On the second day, the dusky monarch was seen flying above them. Presently, he began to hover over them after this manner of a hawk watching for mice. He then, with extended legs, let himself slowly down upon them, actually grappling the backs of the young cattle and frightening the creatures so that they rushed about the field in great consternation. And finally, as he grew bolder and more frequent in his descents, the whole herd broke over the fence and came tearing down to the house like mad. It did not seem to be an assault with intent to kill, but was perhaps a stratagem resorted to in order to separate the herd and expose the lambs which hugged the cattle very closely. When he occasionally alighted upon the oaks that stood near, the branch could be seen to sway and bend beneath him. Finally, as a rifleman started out in pursuit of him, he launched into the air, set his ring wings, and sailed away southward. A few years afterward, in January, Another eagle passed through the same locality, alighting in a field near some dead animal, but tarried briefly. So much by way of identification. 
The golden eagle is common to the northern parts of both hemispheres and places its eyrie on high precipitous rocks. A pair built on an inaccessible shelf of rock along the Hudson for eight successive years. A squad of revolutionary soldiers also, as related by Audubon, found a nest along this river and had an advantage adventure with the bird that came near costing one of their, their numbers his life. His comrades let him down by a rope to secure the eggs or young when he was attacked by the female eagle with such fury that he was obliged to defend himself with his knife. In doing so, by a misstroke, he nearly severed the rope that held him and was drawn up by a single strand from his perilous position. The bald eagle also built on high rocks, according to Audubon. Though Wilson describes the nest of which he saw near Great Egg Harbor in the top of a yar large yellow pine. It was a vast pile of sticks, sods, sedge, grass, reeds, etc., five or six feet high by four broad, and with little or no concavity. It had been, it had been, it had been used for many years, and he was told that the eagles made it a sort of home or lodging place in all seasons. The eagle, in all cases, uses one nest with more or less repair for several years. Many of our common birds do the same. The birds may be divided with respect to this and kindred points into five general classes. First, those that repair or appropriate the last year's nest as the wren, swallow, bluebird, great crested flycatcher, owls, eagles, fish hawk, and a few others. Secondly, those that build anew each season, though frequently rearing more, one, more than one brood in the same nest. Of these, the Phoebe bird is a well-known example. Thirdly, those that build a new nest for each brood, which includes by far the greatest number of species. Fourthly, a limited number that make no nest of their own, but appropriate the abandoned nest of other birds. Finally, those who use no nest at all, but deposit their eggs in the sand, which is the case with a large number of aquatic fowl. 1866, John Burroughs, Bird's Nests, from the book Wake Robin.